Good morning to you all. Thank you for taking time and coming for this uh, dissertation defense. My name is Rana Bishir. I am working with Dr. Jack, and I'm defending my uh, dissertation today. So essentially, for the last five years, I've been what I've been working on my dissertation is now condensed into five journal papers that I in various stage publication. So the uh, the third journal paper, which uh, where I presented one of my original techniques for localization, has already been accepted. And the fourth which is extends that method to a higher frequency, like 2.45 gigahertz, is has a minor revision and it's been re uh, resubmitted to the International Mobile Company. And my second paper will on uh, a conventional localization technique and relates to the placement of receivers is actually have been revised and resubmitted. And the first one I've been this has been under review for a little over a year, and I'm still waiting to hear a report from that. And the final chapter is what I have worked on after the comprehensive exam based on this edition, and I and it's ready for submission. Now all these, uh, all these uh, general papers grew out of uh, conference publications that I've done over this time. And um, all the four listed over there has already been published. And the last one has been submitted to the LCN, which is the new chapter. Now this dissertation is actually organized into five chapters. In fact, I start with the first <coughs> chapter, where I look into the errors that are involved in uh, estimating the radial distance or the distance between the transmitter and the receiver from signal strength. The second chapter is actually on where do I place these receivers on a workspace so that I can get a certain accuracy in locating a transmitter. And the third paper is actually where I presented my new idea, and that was applied for an RFID localization. And the fourth chapter is an extension of the third chapter where I extended two frequencies in the range of 2.45 gigahertz. And the final chapter is where do I place these receivers when you are using my technique of cross correlation based localization? So essentially, what is real-time <coughs> localization system? A lot of places you don't have GPS coverage, especially if you're looking at works, you know, workspace like factory floor, indoor malls, you know, things, office spaces. You don't have GPS coverage, but you need. There's a lot of service. There's a need for localization there. So we provide an alternative techniques that using signal strength or. You can use time of arrival. This is measuring the time between the transmitter and the receiver. Or you can use time difference of arrival where you uh, locate, where you find the time difference between two receivers. Or the angle of arrival can be used to locate the transmitter. Or the method that I'm presenting, which is the signal strength based localization. So the signal strength based localization broadly is classified into two methods. One is range based method or range free method. Range based method is essentially you're trying to estimate the distance to a transmitter from multiple receivers, and you use multilateration or trilateration to find the, the position. Ideally, you rely on some freeze transmission equation at far field to use the relationship between the radial distance and the power signal measured by a receiver. The range-free method is essentially you take a map of the, the RSSI map of your area, and you store that in a file, and then when you have an unknown transmitter transmitting the signal, you try to find out using fingerprinting techniques or pattern matching to where that is actually happening in your yeah, workspace. So this is actually the top view of the lab that we conducted most of our localization experiments. This is ER 114 lab, uh, Dr. Jack's lab. And uh, what the fun of the first thing, yes, how did you get this picture? I was just going to say, how on earth did you get this picture? This is the advantage of having NSF students. Uh, <laughs> what I did basically was uh, we, we, we took camera you know, like uh, the phone cameras and took uh, pictures of it and used the, the Microsoft Panorama stitching software to stitch all those things <laughs> together. So uh, it, it's, it's kind of like a Google indoors, you know, <laughs> DMAP or indoors. Yeah, so, so one of the first things that we did was actually collect the variation of the signal strength over the lab. And what you see here is actually the heat map of the RSSI variation over this area. And what you can see that the receiver was here. And what I have done is move the transmitter along a grid per pattern, and then try to see the mesh of the signal strength. And I, as you can see, there is actually a gradient of the signal strength. This is a bad area. This is a good area. As you move away from the receiver here, you know, uh, towards this location, things are really bad here. But there are points around you know, areas that you cannot expect, you didn't really expect, but to have some really bad signal strength. I'm sorry. I don't understand this. Oh, sorry. OK. So what you're seeing here is a heat map of the variation of the signal strength. Heat map? Heat map it is just means that the a, a color, I'm varying the color intensity, okay. or the color to uh, represent the signal strength. So the red represents really bad signal strength. 
and the blue represents. Oh, that was the problem because usually red is high signal, blue is no signal. No, the no. reason the reason I represented this way is because the what the, the wireless receivers they give the signal in dBm, and they give in positive dBm, so it's minus 90 dBm is a really bad signal. So, but they output the result as 90, 90 as a value of 90. So this region is 90, and this is like th minus 30 dBm. So this is good regions. So that I just directly plotted that on a heat map, you know, using MATLAB. So that's why this uh, plot is that way. So this is bad. This is good. Blue is good. Red is bad. Okay. Red is fire. Bad. <laughs> this is a dB scale. Yes, that's right. dB scale. <clears throat> now, a practical application. Uh, what, what, what's your comment as far as the dB range? Is this? In a real application, right? Yeah, most of the wireless sensors, uh, receivers that I've looked into, they plot, they provide a uh, dB range only from around minus 22 dBm to around minus 92 dBm. So that's that's uh, that's not too many variation. In fact, to have a one uh, dBm change, you have to have a 25 percent change in the power between the uh, the two samples. That's that's a significant amount of change. But in a lot of in a small area like this, we have seen. I will show you some plots later how they. DBM changes over this. You have seen considerable change, but that change is not basically due to freeze transmission model because that's a far field, you know, uh, l large uh, large wireless wireless um, variation model. But more of the the fact that you have a lot of multipath effects, which is creating this variation, and that's what you see here. You know, areas region here. This could be because there is interference from you know reflection from multiple points that is really distractingly added here. You know, so that kind of variation is what I try to utilize. You don't, you try to use the phase transmission. You get a gradient like this, but you cannot account for all the small, minor variation that happen in between with that component. Okay, for for all these experiments, I used a hardware which is the commercially available uh, IEEE eight hundred two fifteen point four transceiver. So essentially, it operates at two point four five free ISM band, and um, the. the this is a receiver that we used, and then we had a microcontroller for all of our coordination of transmission and uh, reception. And then, what I also have done is I played with the the antenna diversity. So I wanted to have better accuracy in localization. So I had to have, have two antennas with two receivers, and then their power are combined to get the better accuracy, which I'll explain later. Now, what is the main motivation for using an RTL? Uh, sorry, the signal strength based localization. Essentially, you know, it's cheap. The signal strength information is available in pretty much any wireless device that is commercially available. So it's most of the cases it is nothing more than just a software update. And uh, that's that's where this uh, advantage of this method comes in. But what's the side effect of this thing? You don't, as I mentioned, you only have a one dBm change between sample points. So you don't get really fine-grained localization with this technique. So you have a coarse-grained localization. So, so but the, the time and angle based methods that are currently available can provide you with a really good accuracy if you have a really good line of sight. But if you don't have a line of sight and things bounce, you know, reflecting around, you get really bad accuracy. And that's where one of the advantages of signal strength based is that you can still be tolerant to a lot of non line of sight uh, signals. So, what is the main goal of my dissertation? I, I wanted to develop a method to localize a transmitter from the signal strength that I measure. And, that, and secondly, I wanted to find a method where I can place my receivers in the localization area so that I have some guarantees as to where the transmitter is. A lot of people say, okay, I have a method, but what is your guaranteed accuracy? What kind of mean or median or 90th percentile accuracy do you have with your, that, those kind of guarantees is what I wanted to provide in this uh, dissertation. By transmitter, you mean the signal from RFID? Uh, RFID, yes. Uh, the, that is let, that's not, yeah, that's one application. The RFID is one application. But what I mean by transmitter, for most part, is an active transmitter that is transmitting signal. RFID is just one chapter that I had to get into. So when I mean by transmitter, is an active device transmitting a signal. And the receiver is also an active device measuring the signal. So on that Boeing plant that you showed, you don't have to go back. There are these active transmitters spread all over for whatever reason. That's right. And you want to locate them. That's right. So I have this passive, not passive, sorry, the receivers placed around this workspace, and they will be monitoring these active transmitters. They will be monitoring the signals from these active transmitters. And unlike an RFID, these transmitters are sending a CW signal, or are they modulated? For, or yeah, that, that's right. These, uh, for this particular hardware, they are modulated. They are, you know, in fact, it is uh, GPSK and uh, phase shifting, the kind of modulation that they're using. but. 
what I'm actually looking into is just the power information. I'm not really looking into the I and Q or any of those you know, individual components of the signal. So, so the, the paper is basically, my entire dissertation is organized into two sections. In fact, the first two chapters deal with a more conventional method for localization. It uses the range estimation from signal strength. The last three chapters is actually what I you know, provided a new method called cross-correlation based localization. And the, 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 the third chapter is where I that, you know, that was a little bit from my you know, normal active transmitter and receivers. I go into RFID, and the fourth chapter comes back again into the active transmitters and receivers, and the fifth chapter is a placement. So, so the first chapter. The first chapter is basically I wanted to figure out what how how can you look into how can you account for all the errors that you see in a range-based estimation technique. So a typical scenario, if I explain here, is basically you have this transmitter. And then you have a bunch of receivers that are placed around your workspace. And then the base station is where you collect all the signal strength information that is from the receivers and compute the estimate, the position. So the transmitter is constantly sending out signals. And then these receivers get the signal strength information and it sends it to the base station. And that's where all the location estimation happens. And how does this location estimation work? So essentially, you have a freeze transmission equation translating the power that is coming in to a radial distance. And then you have this Euclidean equation, which is basically telling what is the radial estimate between a known position of a receiver and an unknown position of a transmitter. So your cost function is nothing but a sum of square of this, at this error. And the objective is actually to minimize, to find a transmitter location that will minimize this cost function. And that's what you get here. That's basically saying that the, my position of the transmitter is the location which will minimize this cost function. But the problem with this equation is that it is affected by outliers. There's a lot of problem with outliers. And that's standard. So what I try to provide is actually a grading. Normally, when you have a variant, when the variance is changing for a least square problem, you try to scale the measurement by the estimated variance. And that's where the R factor, the new parameter that I derived to quantify the error, comes in. So it's basically a weighted least square method is what I'm using for localization. Now the weights are what I call the R factor. So my primary objective of this paper was to come up with the estimate for the radial distance variance, which I basically call as the R factor, and that forms the weight. And the second part was, is there any way that I can reduce those um, the radial distance estimation variance? And I looked into the uh, diversity combination. It could be antenna diversity combination, or it could be frequency diversity combination. I looked into all those things to see how it actually changes my my location estimates. So some of the previous work that were done in this area is one of them is called the proximity in signal space. So the idea was to quantify these receivers based on here signal strength. So it's more of a heuristics. And they, their idea was, if you have a good signal strength, there is a good receiver. Bad signal strength, bad. But in multipath failing, that's not the situation. You can have an additive, constructive, really good signal, even though the quality of that signal you know, for radial distance estimation might be really bad. You, it might be a far away signal give a very good signal strength, but the radial distance estimate comes out to be pretty close. That's not good. Now, then there are some statistical tests done to quantify the signal. Can I quantify the statistics of a, of a signal based on using some uh, chi-square test? Can I say, OK, this particular receiver is actually under non line of state condition, or this receiver is under line of state condition using some statistical properties of the signal that comes in? The third paper is basically looking into the binary classification based on whether the signal has a Gaussian property or not. When you have a really good signal, your noise in your signal strength is just the thermal noise. In that case, the, the thermal noise is mostly is Gaussian. So we, you look for some Gaussian test, like you know, you look for the higher order cumulants to see if those are zero, if they are zero, their signal is good. But we are not looking for a binary classification. We wanted a finer grade classification of these receivers based on their uh, signals, uh, signal quality. So some of the assumptions that I started with was I assumed that the noise that you have, the multipath noise, can be modeled as a Ricean distribution. And why did I choose Ricean distribution? It has some interesting properties. In fact, you can model this Ricean distribution by varying the signal strength, that is the A to sigma x squared, from either having a very good signal with a Gaussian distribution, or you can make it like A equal to zero for a very bad signal, which is Rayleigh distribution. That is when you don't have a clear line of sight with your transmitter and receiver. 
And then second, I took this standard equation, which is the freeze transmission equation, but instead of having n being two, I made it as a parameter that would be estimated for the uh, the workspace under consideration. The, the, the rising distribution, you said noise. You didn't mean noise, did you? It, what I meant was A is the signal. Yeah. And this distribution accounts with signal plus the noise. Okay, I thought this was, you use this only because you have interference. The signal is not a one. When I say noise, it's a multipath fitting. Okay, that's what I'm trying to figure out because your, your terminology is throwing me off. Sorry for No, no, no. I mean, noise is one thing. Fading is another. Yeah. They're not the same. From, uh, from a communication perspective, yes. The noise is actually the signal clarity. But for a, for a localization perspective, anything that throws me off of my good radial estimate is a noise for Fading. Yes. Okay. So that, that, when you said noise, I didn't understand why you would have rise in noise. Okay. So it affects my signal quality. So, okay. so based on those assumptions, assumption about the fading, what distribution the fading has, and also the phase transmission equation, I derived the mean estimate of my radial distance and also the variance of my radial distance. And in fact, it turned out, you know, with, with Rysian, that Bessel functions and all those things, it turns out the equation for the mean and the variance turns out to be really complicated. Mohammed, well, but why, why, why are, why are radial distribution? If, if your signal is, if your signal is bad, why a radial distribution? Why that distribution? Rysian distribution. Well, you said you're using a Ricean, so you can go from Gaussian to Rayleigh. Rayleigh, yes. And and uh, Gaussian is if you have good. That's and, right. And uh, uh, Rayleigh if you have a bad. That's right. Signal. Oh, why? Why, why Rayleigh? Rayleigh? In fact, the Rayleigh distribution arises from the you know Rayleigh distribution has been shown empirically to have you know the, the, when you don't have a clear line of sight with the signal, empirically it was shown to have a Rayleigh distribution. So there is a paper out there which looks into all these different statistics of the signal whether. You know, you can quantify them either as Ricean or Rally or you know Gaussian based on you know what kind of properties it is showing. That that's what it was. It's actually the power. Okay. Yeah. I mean, is there anything intuitive that says it should be a, a Rayleigh distribution or? Um, it, it, okay. Intuitive Rayleigh distribution arises when you have two normal the, the the square root of two no, uh, square of normal distribution. So x squared plus y squared to the square root. Now the x and y are supposed to be the i and q of a signal. And if x and y doesn't have any direct signal, but it's actually all the noise that is around, then you can model them as x and y as Gaussian noise with zero um, uh, mean. With zero mean. So zero mean, zero means you don't have a direct line of sight signal. It's all noise that is coming around it. So when you take a square root of x squared plus y squared, which is